chance of scattered showers and thunderstorms, low around 76. Friday, mostly sunny and hot, with a chance of afternoon showers and thunderstorms, high around 98. And Friday night, partly to mostly cloudy skies, with a chance of showers and thunderstorms, low around 75. Keep it here on Oak 93.5. I'm Nowcast Meteorologist Jim Vaughn. Ladies and gentlemen, you're now tuned into Chat City with P. Ross. Conversations and interviews are in the queue. Listen or join in. Here she is, P. Ross. Greetings, 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 everyone. Thank you for tuning in to Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross, and I want you to help me welcome my two very special guests in the in the studio with me today. That would be Mrs. Marie Baker, who is a uh, organ transplant candidate, and Mr. Ellis Ray, who is an organ transplant recipient. Thank you for coming in to be with us here today. Ellis and Marie. So for a topic today, I chose to discuss organ transplants and fighting kidney disease. There are currently 106,000 people on a nationwide organ transplant waiting list, according to organdonor.gov. This list is a diverse list that, com that is comprised of elderly people, young people, and people of different genders and ethnicities. Um, there are 78 organs in our human bodies. Um, and they are, there are 12 organ systems within our bodies. We have seven main organs, and that's our liver, bladder, kidneys, heart, stomach, and intestines. Today, we're going to focus on kidneys and fighting kidney disease. That's why our guests are here today. Um, kidneys are the bean-shaped organs in our abdomen, mm -hmm. and they're on either side of your spine, uh, and they're below your ribs your rib cage, and behind your abdomen. Their main job is to cleanse the blood of toxins and transform the waste into urine. I've chosen chronic kidney disease as a focus, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about chronic kidney disease. Um, it's also known as kidney failure, and we hear a lot about kidney failure. We know someone to ha that has experienced kidney failure or that is experiencing kidney failure. And it involves a gradual loss of kidney function. Your kidneys filter waste and excess fluids from your blood, which are then removed in your urine. Advanced chronic kidney disease can cause dangerous levels of fluid, electrolytes, and waste to build up in your body. In the early stages of chronic kidney disease, you might find or you may have a few symptoms. Uh, you might not realize that you have kidney disease until the condition is advanced. Treatment for chronic disease, kidney disease, uh, focuses on slowing the progression of kidney damage, usually by controlling the cause, but even controlling the cause might not keep kidney damage from progressing. Uh, cr chronic kidney disease can progress to end-stage kidney failure, which is fatal without <coughs> alter, al excuse me, without artificial filtering, which is known as dialysis mm -hmm. or of a kidney transplant. All right. Now, with that said, we're going to talk to our guest today, and we're going to start with Marie Baker. And I want to just say that I got that information from Mayo Clinic. So thank you, Mayo Clinic. Mm -hmm. um, but Marie, um, let's walk into your story. You've been on dialysis for five years now, and you're on a kidney transplant waiting list. Yes, I am. What exactly is your kidney diagnosis? Um. It is chronic kidney failure. It is. Um, I've been in kidney failure. Um, I started long before I started dialysis. I was going into kidney failure. Um, I started going to see a kidney doctor about five or six years before I went complete, before my kidneys completely failed. Um, and we were doing everything we could to keep me off of dialysis, you know, changing my eating habit, changing everything I would do, but you know, it was, my function was going down. Um, oh. Go ahead. Okay, no, I'm sorry. Uh, were you finished with that sentence? 
No, but I'm good. Okay, go ahead. No, go ahead. Finish. It was going down, and um, I finally had to end up going on dialysis. Uh huh. Now tell us uh, your story. Did you just wake up mo- one morning and start feeling ill? No. What led you to going to the doctor? Okay. Um, I had high blood pressure and diabetes both together. Hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. High blood sh- blood pressure and diabetes. Yes. Now, um, had you known you had high blood pressure? I knew, um, you know, when I was carrying my children, one, I had a hypertension um, just when I was pregnant, and then the other one, I had, had diabetes just when I was pregnant. Mm-hmm. But after I had them, I, you know, wasn't worried about it. You know, my numbers would go down. But later on, you know, without um, diet, exercise, and losing the weight, I, I had to start seeing a doctor. Okay. So can you describe what your, what your symptoms were and um, how it made you feel? Um, with, with hypertension, sometimes you don't feel, feel it at all, mm-hmm. you know. But um, with diabetes, you're thirsty, urination, urinating a lot. Um, and then that's what makes you go start seeing the doctor. Um, and then they are going to treat it with medication. And um, after medication, like with me, it, it just didn't, my function was starting to go down. So it um, just steady went down. Well, it looks like you're doing very well. I mean, that was like five years ago. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And we appreciate you coming here today and sharing your story with our listeners very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, all right. So you went through that ordeal. Yes. And um, I'm sure it was a scary moment for you. It it was um, when I first, when my doctor referred me to a kidney doctor, um, I, I, you know, I talked to him just like you and I are talking. I was like, I don't want to go on dialysis. Um, can can we just do something to keep me off of dialysis? And she did what she could. You know, I, I saw her like three three years, three or four years before I started dialysis. And um, it got to a point where I was um, swelling. So I had to, I had to do something. Mm-hmm. Okay, what type of medications were you on when you began your treatment? Um, when I started dialysis. Well, before the dialysis. Um, I was on, I, can, I, I couldn't remember the name of them now, but I was on like two, maybe three different um, blood pressure medicines. And then I was on insulin and another um, medicine for uh, diabetes. But I, w- I would like to say this, Pauline, sure. and maybe this can help someone. When the doctor um, say, if you're diagnosed like borderline diabetes and borderline hypertension, start working on it right then, mm-hmm. right then. Because borderline, they won't put you on any medication, but you can start working on it with exercise and, and eating right, eating the right stuff. But, you know, when when you're first diagnosed with it, like borderline, if you start working on it right then, mm-hmm. I think that would help, you know. So your message to the listeners is that a healthy diet is very important it's very important and so we should have like started yesterday yes. right because we just it's... don't know how this toxic food is going to affect us later on down the road and which organ it's going to affect and if it's the kidneys mm, which is one of our major organs yes. that that is not a that's not anything good that's correct right okay so um you're on a donor list at yeah. what point in time did your doctor say okay marie we need to do something different. Let's, uh, let's, let's try a donor. Okay. Um, even before I started dialysis, she sent me to Chapel Hill to be worked up on the transplant list. Um, I was inactive on the list almost a year before I started dialysis. Mm. So I, after I started dialysis and I had to have, um, I had a mass in my right kidney and they wanted to make sure it was not kidney before they made me active. Once they um, tested that kidney, and I was on the dial on dialysis, they made me active, which I still have my time. So I've been active um, 
I think for almost five years, I might be hitting six years on the transplant list in, in UNC Chapel Hill. And this year, um, about April, I became active um, MUSC um, in Charleston. Okay. So I'm active on their list, too. So you're on two active transplant. Three. <laughs> three active transplant yes. lists. Yes. In search of a donor. Yes. Right? Okay. I am. All right. Um, so during that time frame when you were waiting to get on a list, I think you said in Chapel Hill first, mm -hmm. Uh, you said there was a year's time that went past. Is mm -hmm. that correct? Yes. What were your thoughts in that year's time, Marie? Um, it was I was it was very scary for me because I wasn't sharing what I was going through with anybody, my family. The only person that knew was the Lord and my husband are the only ones that knew what I was going through at the time. Uh -huh. It was very scary, and I felt like that I had to keep it private. You know, it was my own cross to bear. And um, once I started dialysis, I still didn't tell people, mm -hmm. you know, just maybe my mom. I still wouldn't let um, anybody in. And I took a class in Raleigh um, about sharing um, about sharing your stories because a living donor, they want you to try to get a living donor. So I, I took that class to help me out um, because I had a lot of anxieties about sharing my story with people, sharing my need with people. And that, that, that class really helped me. Like you, nobody, kn if you don't let people know what you need, they're not got, you know, how are they going to know? Right. You can miss so, out on something. Yes. Really so I, I started sharing with people and it's still hard for me to share with people mm -hmm. what I'm going through. And, um, I, I share with people because I do have a need. Okay. And I'm going to give you a house of applause for breaking through your shyness and decide, deciding to share yes. with people because yes. I'm sure there's somebody listening today that really needs your inspiration, yes. okay? Now, what was your family's response when you broke the news? Okay, um, my mom, who is a, a, a believer in miracles, said it's going to be all right. You're going to get a kidney. You're going to be healed. And just all this positive... And um, one guy told me, don't receive anything negative. Mm -hmm. If somebody has something negative to say, don't receive it. Don't receive anything negative. So that's what my family have done. They rallied around me, um, helped with donations. So when I do get a transplant, I'll have that. And um, they help encourage me, help to take care of me, um, made obligations to take care of me once I do get the transplant. And um, a lot of people might be saying, well, why won't your family donate? But kidney failure runs in my family. High mm -hmm. blood pressure, um, diabetes run in my family. Um, that's why my family is not able to, to donate. But they were willing to donate. Uh -huh. But they, they Well, can't. we're going to give your family a house of applause yes. for having the willingness to help you. Yes. If you are just tuning in, you're listening to Chat City with P. Ross on Oak 93.5 WRLY Raleigh. I am your host, P. Ross, and I have in the station with me today two lovely people, Miss Marie Kennedy Baker, who is an organ transplant candidate, and Mr. Ellis Ray, who is an organ transplant recipient. And they have decided to come in and share their stories with all of us today, and I am so grateful for them to do that. Marie, let's go back to your family. Okay. Um, now, I just want to let our listeners know that I've known Marie for some time now. We are classmates. Yes. And, uh, you know, classmates, when you leave high school, some you see, some you don't. Mm -hmm. And over the years, Marie has won. I've seen here and there every now and then. But I first heard her story on Facebook. Um, I believe there was a video that I saw and uh, she was looking for a donor. And then later on, or I don't know which came first, if I saw the video first or if I saw this post. And the post is your family showing you support, your family and friends. Uh, I believe it was your mom standing behind a nicely made mm -hmm. uh, poster or a banner. And it wasn't a cheap banner either. I mean, it was mm -hmm. vinyl down, mm -hmm. pretty blue color. Mm -hmm. Or was that purple? purple. Okay, mm -hmm. a pretty purple color. And it had 
an inscription, something like, uh, my daughter needs a kidney? Mm -hmm. Is that what it had on yes, there? Or tell me the what it said. I think it said, my daughter, Marie uh, Baker, needs a living donor. Okay. Kid, living kidney donor, I think it said. Uh-huh. And the background of that, I mean, you're at a lake in front of a gazebo, or she was at a lake in front of a gazebo, and there were two other, I believe, your family members yes, or friends? My grandchildren. Your yes. grandchildren, okay, mm -hmm. and they were standing next to her. And mm -hmm. that picture said more than a thousand words. I mean, it showed a lot of love in that, that, that picture. And I was like, wow, you know, what can I do to help? Um, Tell us more about your family uh, support. What has that been like for you? Oh, my family support has been amazing. Um, they understand, you know, when I don't feel like doing something, they understand. Um, they understand what it takes to do dialysis and work a full-time job. So um, they help out a lot. My, my husband, J.D., he helps out. He makes sure... And matter of fact, he is the one who um, hooks me up to the machine where I can work, you know, at night so I okay. can work. Now, let's go back to you working. Mm -hmm. I was going to mention this, too. Like I said, um, Marie and I know each other and we live in the same area. Yes. So we just happen. Well, I just happen to be in a court. Uh, situation not me personally I'm there with someone else okay mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the courtroom and I notice Marie is working closely with a judge mm -hmm. now I'm not I don't know if I should say that or not I don't want to say anything to affect you no, uh, employment wise mm -hmm. but the thought that went through my head is wow this lady is dealing with kidney issues mm -hmm. and she is up here handling her career like a champ and so I just want to applaud you on that. Oh, my heart's applause died there. Um, I mean, such inspiration for others. And I know that our government system isn't so nice sometimes when mm -hmm. people uh, who are, you know, really should be at home resting or mm -hmm. enjoying, you know, just away from the workplace are, you know, working full-time jobs, you know. Um, no excuse for anybody that's just being lazy and doesn't want to work, but... Um, I just want to say, wow, that was just amazing. Um, now, uh, you work in a full-time job. How is that for you? Oh, it, it's good. It's good. I, I have to, I have to keep working. I have to, I have to push myself. Uh -huh. Um, I like to say along with my family, my coworkers are amazing to me too. Uh -huh. When I need time off for doctor's appointments, when I need time, when I'm just, feeling down I get my days off that I need off mm -hmm. um um they work around my schedule and work um as far as me going to court they work with my court schedule they really have been really really good to me and um it's, it's just good to be in a working environment like the one I'm in now well we're gonna give a shout out to your <laughs> More <laughs> Your co-workers, because I know sometimes co-workers can be a challenge sometimes, but mm -hmm. I thank God that they have been working well with you. They have. Now, you mentioned your husband. Mm -hmm. um, he knows how to help you with your treatments. Is that at home? At home. Okay, so tell us what that is like. I mean, did he have to take a special class? What did he have to do to learn what to do for you? Okay, he we trained um, when it was time we started training. Um, we trained with um, Pinehurst three about three months before I, I took my mach took a machine home. Um, okay, and he, when you say Pinehurst, Pinehurst what? Davida. Davida is that mm -hmm. a dialysis center? It is. Okay, all right. We train. I knew what type of um, dialysis I was going to do um, when my daughter and I talked about it. I knew I was going to do it at home and try to keep my job and the reason why I keep my job is because of the, the insurance and you know um to get a transplant you have to have that insurance and um I just and I like my job so um we trained um he hooks me up we do um what what is called home hemo okay. so it's it's Dallas is through the blood at home so he hooks me up make sure my area is sanitized 
He makes um, he makes sure everything is done. When I get off from work, I just change my clothes and I get ready for him to hook me up. I do dialysis five hours, was well, four hours and like 12 minutes. He takes me down, uh, cleans everything up, and all I have to do is worry about going to bed. He, he does like, make sure I eat while I'm on my machine, and I do dialysis four nights a week. Wow. So that helps, you know, the four nights. I try to do most of them on the weekend, so I will have a couple of nights during the week free. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, I want to say Thank God for your husband. Oh, yes. I thank God for him. <laughs> I do. To help you there. I do. Marie, I'm going to ask you this. What are, what are your thoughts when you're hooked up to a machine for five hours? Oh, my goodness. I, I have all, all kinds of emotions. I go from, um, um, I dread it, first of all, coming through the door. I know what I have to do. So it's a dread. Yes, it's a dread. Mm-hmm. Um, and some some days is kind of painful and I um just try to keep a positive attitude like I know you know soon I'll have a I'll have a donor or or uh some miracle is going to happen to me I mean I just have to keep that in my mind if I don't I'll be you know and then I have to think about other people that's doing the same thing I I'm doing now Mm -hmm. if I don't I'll be just like pity all the time and I can't I don't you know we don't have time for pity yes. no we don't have time for it okay have you met any other um transplant candidates since you've been on this journey I I have I've I've um um met like when I go to to the transplant centers to you know do my blood work or um my doctor's appointments I meet people there I have a friend who who's had a transplant. Um, I think maybe more than a year, and she's doing very well. She's doing real good with her transplant. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Yes. Now, um, when you first started your treatment, how long did it take you to get back to what I would say your regular routine at home and on the job? Um, I, I just those those three months that we trained I I went to work every day I just got off early mm-hmm. to go and train I didn't I didn't really change a routine you know um the only thing now is doing the treatments you don't you don't have that time like with your family that you usually would have mm-hmm. and you don't have that time like if JD and I wanted to go away for the weekend like Friday Saturday and Sunday mm-hmm. I would have to make sure I got my treatments in before I left, or I would have to take my machine with me. Okay. And we we um we hadn't been on vacation since we did go on a vacation in twenty 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 right before COVID hit. Uh-huh. And I had to take my machine with me, which I had him, my brother in law, and my brother helping me with the machine because it's it's kind of big. Oh, okay. And we did treatments on on the trip. Uh huh. All right. Now you said COVID. Tell me. When what were your thoughts when COVID entered into our midst, and you being someone, what they say, an underlying condition? Mm-hmm. What were your thoughts? Oh wow, I um, I was I would get kind of fearful. I wear my mask all the time, and um, one thing my job did was when everybody went back to work, they still had funds, so they let me kind of work from home. Mm-hmm. For a little while, for for a month or two, mm-hmm. and then after I worked at, from home a month or two, I came in and worked just in the afternoons. Uh, was it, when it wasn't so busy. Mm-hmm. Um, I I just um, I did get fearful there um, at the beginning, but after a while, I got more relaxed. Mm-hmm. And matter of fact, I did get COVID uh, the beginning of this year oh, wow. in February, uh-huh. but it was just like a bad cold. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, and, you know, I, I thank God it was just just like having a bad cold. All right. Well, I'm glad you didn't have any complications, serious complications. It was uh, a while going through that. Yeah. Yes. Wow. Okay. Um, if you're just tuning in, we are talking about kidneys, kidney failure, um, being an organ transplant uh, recipient, as well as being 
on a list, being a candidate for a kidney. Um, we have Marie Baker here with us sharing her story, and we also have Mr. Ellis Ray, who, who we are going to hear from a little later. Uh, Marie, huh? you look great. You look well, and you don't look like you are going through anything <laughs> right now. So I just want to encourage you to uh, keep doing what you're doing and keep inspiring others uh, who may be going through this fight. Your testament is a great one. And um, again, I thank you for choosing to come in and, and share your story with us. We're not done with you yet. We've got some more talking to do with you <laughs> later on in the show. But I want to go ahead and get Ellis in at this time. All right. So, Mr. Ellis Ray, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being on Chat City with P. Ross and sharing your story as well. Um, you are a kidney transplant recipient. Um, let's start with your story going back to when you were moving from Virginia to be closer to your parents who were aging in North Carolina. Um, and I think that was in 2002. Is that correct? That sounds about right. Okay. Uh, your mom well, has suffered well, a stroke. Is that right? Yeah, and, she's, she suffered a stroke in 2002, but I had actually started <coughs> transitioning back to North Carolina back in 94. Mm-hmm. I moved from Roanoke, Virginia to Greensboro. Okay. Yeah. And it was in 2008, your body goes into renal failure mm -hmm. um, as a result of undiagnosed high blood pressure. First of all, tell us what renal failure is. Well, <clears throat> renal failure is when your kidneys stop, stop working, and that confuses a lot of people, I think, because renal, unless you are in the medical field, renal seems not to have any connection to your kidneys, but that's exactly what it is. Your, your kidneys start failing. Mm -hmm. um, and then they have different stages of renal failure. I think the worst is end stage renal failure. Mm -hmm. it's, been, it's been a while since I've studied the, a lot of the terminology because when I first got sick, mm -hmm. I wanted to know everything mm -hmm. about what I was facing. So. While I was on dialysis, I did a lot of reading, a lot of research, but that seems like now in the dark ages, I've probably, I have probably forgotten most of what I <laughs> learned back then. Well, that's okay. That's okay. <laughs> We've got Google on our hands, so we can, uh, <laughs> we can Google anything we need to know, I guess. Um, now, what was your reaction when your doctor announced to you that you are in kidney failure and need a kidney? My story, in, in a way, is kind of funny. I didn't, what happened is, first of all, I've never been sick. Okay. So I think people that have suffered different types of illnesses uh, throughout life, they're a little bit more on guard mm -hmm. because they don't want to revisit where they've already been. But I had never been sick before, so uh, it came it came about as a total surprise to me, plus most of the people in my family were healthy people. Mm -hmm. My great grandfather lived to be 93. Wow. And his daughter, which was my grandmother, lived to be 100. And she wasn't actually sick when she died. Um, she, we, uh, my, we, the family made a decision to uh, put her in a nursing facility. Mm -hmm. And some of us know what that's like. But anyway, anyway mm -hmm. not the ideal place to. Uh, live your last months or years but uh, they actually uh, they had one nurse on duty that night and uh, my grandmother had to go to the bathroom and uh, she was on a walker mm -hmm. and escorted her to the bathroom the nurse got in front of the walker and my grandmother fell backwards lost her balance and fell backwards now I don't know what kind of training that nurse had, but I would <laughs> think that if a patient's going to fall, they're probably not going to fall over the top of the walk. <laughs> so, right, right. So, so if you're going to position a nurse somewhere, it seems like to be common sense would tell you have her in the back. But anyway, she <laughs> fell. Uh, she fractured her hip. Mm. She had to uh, uh, have surgery on that hip. And I think if my memory serves, uh, she did find in the surgery her problem was the anesthesia. A mm -hmm. lot of people don't realize how dangerous that drug is, mm -hmm. but it's a necessity mm -hmm. when you're undergoing uh, that. But in, anyway, in 90, and I was living in Greensboro, 
and uh, I got a call that my mother had had a stroke. So I was close enough to home so that I could just get here in an hour, less than an hour and a half. And that surprised me because I didn't know what a stroke was. <laughs> I, <laughs> could, I couldn't understand how a person could go to bed one night Uh of all of these appointments they had to attend to the next day. And then you wake up and half your body's not working. Uh That made no sense to me. But then, you know, you start, you start reading about strokes and you find out that it's a neurological thing. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, Your brain controls uh, uh, the functions of your, uh, your limbs. So the stroke affects a certain part of the brain. So when that part of the brain's not working, the part of your body that that side of the brain controls is also mm-hmm. not working. Now, for the sake of time, let's get to what um, what your doctor said to you, Ellis, well, when he said you need a kidney. I have a tendency to ramble sometimes, but <laughs> I, I actually did did not have a doctor. Okay. When I left Greensboro, because uh-huh. I'd never been sick, I would see doctors if I got a cold or something, but I never had a permanent physician. So when I came down to check on uh, my mom, mm-hmm. Uh, and I was back and forth. The, something that happened to me, uh, I used to, uh, you know, I, you know, I served time in the military in uh, in uh, Europe, and I acquired a taste for beer. Mm-hmm. And one morning, <laughs> well, my mom's not listening to that, so I'm good. <laughs> but one morning, I, I grabbed a beer to drink. Uh, and I couldn't keep it down. Mm-hmm. So I looked in the mirror and I said, you yeah, man, I think you're sick. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I, uh, I went, I did go see a doctor then. Mm-hmm. Uh, I went to urgent care mm-hmm. and the nurse came in, took my blood pressure and she looked at me and she says, Oh my God. She says, Oh my God. I didn't know what, what was going on, but she said, I said, well, <laughs> I said, what's what's happening? She said, I'll be right back. I need to go talk to the doctor. So she went, came back a few minutes later and took my blood pressure again. Now her, oh, my, oh my gods, were more escalated. Oh, my God. Uh, I uh. said, sweetheart, if you don't tell me what's wrong, one of us looked like they're about to stroke out in here, and I hope uh-huh. it's not going to be me. Uh-huh. <laughs> but uh, anyway, at the time, I was dating this young lady in Virginia, and she just happened to be a scientist. Because what the doctor did is he prescribed lisinopril, which is a uh, high blood pressure medication. And I took that for a couple of days, but I had an allergic reaction to it. It made my face swell up. Mm. So I was communicating with her at the time. And she, she said, look, you don't need to be taking blood pressure medication. You need to go to the hospital and let somebody draw your blood and find out, analyze your blood and find out what's going on with you. Mm-hmm. So I did. I, I remember very well. Dad, My dad was cooking dinner. And uh, I told him I was going to go over to the ER to get uh, some blood work done. So I said, well, what, what time do you think dinner's going to be ready? He said, 6.30. I said, okay, I'll be back in a little bit. Well, I got over to the hospital. They took my labs, and I was sitting there on the bed with the doctor. I was sitting on the side of the bed. The doctor came in, he, and he starts telling me the story about people that are faced with different illnesses. He never he never <laughs> came out directly and said that you got renal failure. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the conversation, or or when I got a word in, I said, "Well, look, doc, you think uh, you think I might have to do something like dialysis sometime?" He said, "Oh yeah, Mr. Ray, you're going on this evening." Hmm. Okay. So it was and, serious. Um, it, you know, I don't know what was going through my mind at the time, mm-hmm. but it kind of felt like a death sentence because I said I never heard of, I never heard of uh, dialysis. Mm-hmm. All these were new terms to me. I never knew anybody that had kidney failure. Uh-huh. So I'm, learn- I'm learning a lot in a few seconds. And then the other thing is I had to call my dad and tell him I wasn't going to be home for dinner. Uh-huh. And so he was excited. He got a little bit anxious to, uh, after I explained to him what was going on. Uh-huh. So he said, I guess I'll come over to the hospital, pick your car up, and take it home. Uh-huh. I said, look, I was driving a convertible at the time, and it was full of gas, so all I could think of is my dad was riding around in my car with the top down, and I'm going to (laughs) have an empty tank when I get home. Uh Anyway, on a serious note, that was was my introduction to kidney failure. I got on dialysis, and uh, I was on dialysis for 
actually eight years when I think about it. Wow. Eight years. But mm -hmm. I was not interested at first in getting a transplant. Okay. I Why used, not? Because I, I knew I knew it was invasive, first of all, mm -hmm. and I had never been sick. I said, well, I, I, there's got to be a way we can repair this damage. So I took the holistic approach okay. to healing. I knew very little about it then, but everything I read about the holistic approach to healing was encouraging to me. And it was non-invasive. Okay. I'm scared to death of needles. Uh -huh. So, so okay, so you took the holistic approach. Yeah. How long did, did you try that treatment plan? I don't know. I guess probably a couple of years. A couple of years. Okay. So that treatment plan obviously did not work for you. Not saying it wouldn't work for anybody else, but it just didn't agree with you. Is that correct? Well, the thing is that I was listening to Marie talk about um, some of the times that she and her husband traveled. Uh-huh. You know, when I went on when I went on dialysis, I worked from home anyway. I was a uh, mortgage banker, so pretty much I could work wherever I was. All I needed was a computer and a phone. Mm -hmm. So being on dialysis didn't didn't freak me out or anything. So, but the holistic approach just seemed to be less invasive, and I like the fact that uh, during a holistic approach, you. Uh, you um you're trying to heal the whole body that's your that's your that's your objective get mm -hmm. the whole body well again mm -hmm. whereas medicines may may target one problem that you have and may cause the problem in other areas that you have uh -huh. so i think a lot of medication is toxic it may all be toxic i don't know but uh mm -hmm. well in in your case so um we let's get down to where your doctor said okay um, holistic is not working or you, you guys decide that's not working for you and it's time for you to become a candidate for a transplant. What was that process like for you? Well, let, let, me, let me just say this. The doctors never discouraged me from doing a holistic oh, okay. medicine. They okay. never discouraged, but they don't encourage it either. Uh -huh. As a uh -huh. matter of fact, I flat, flat out asked the doctor one day that he really believe in holistic medicine and he told me no and he was uh he was a um a doctor from the middle east and i said well why not he said well there's no data to support it but we can pretty much understand why that is because insurance companies make a ton of money from selling your drugs right right and if you get well you don't need drugs anymore mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right so you right. gotta kind of look at it from both angles here i said so you, you then you gotta know you gotta decide who you're gonna trust on this but the thing with dialysis is that i didn't i wasn't taking the home hemo as marie was doing i was i had to go into a facility every day and, and dialyze for three or four hours and then I was good for another two days. But the thing is, is during these two days that you're two or three days that you're not dialyzing, you're building up toxins in your system. Mm -hmm. So, but so if you're going to go out of town for a few days, you have to arrange for your treatment to take place wherever you go mm -hmm. prior to you getting there. And that gets to be a pain sometimes because if you go on vacation, and then you decide, well, I want to stay a few extra days. Mm -hmm and you haven't arranged treatment for those few extra days, then you either got to get sick or go home. <laughs> so yeah. it gets to be inconvenient that way. Okay. For those of you that are just tuning in, we are on Oak 93.5, Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross. And in the station with me today, I have two people who are dealing with kidney issues. Um, one is a candidate, Ms. Marie Baker, and one is a recipient, Mr. Ellis Ray. And we've been just been talking with Ellis. Uh, Ellis, you too, on your journey, had a team like Marie, uh, a team of supporters that consisted of family and friends. Uh, I had the opportunity to meet your team, and I do believe that's how we met. <laughs> <laughs> you're, yes. You're exactly right. All right. So tell us about that this team that was formed to assist you in your search for a kidney well i had a i had a couple of teams one team and that i believe that was a team you were on you worked uh you guys worked on 
fundraising mm -hmm. uh, because that was a requirement. When, when, you know, the kidney procedure, the transplant procedure, I don't care if you're getting a kidney or a heart or lungs or whatever, it's an expensive. Mm -hmm. It's very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, so they encourage the um, candidate to get busy in some type of run fundraising project. And a lot of that is not just to raise the funds for the kidneys, but it's also um, designed to bring awareness to the community mm -hmm. um, about the, the need for organ transplant. So uh, you were on that team. We did a concert in the park. And uh, I don't, if I remember correctly, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't fare too well with that, that concert. Mm -hmm. So. I'm saying, God, if we're going to get, if we're going to raise $25,000 this way, I may be an old man by the time <laughs> I get my kid. To now, let me say right <laughs> off, I was not an organizer on that part, but uh, let me say this. Now, let's, that takes me back to when you got the call that there was a match for you and your kidney. Um, and I think it was at the same time or around the time uh, that this concert was going to take place. Is that correct? My my memory is a little foggy on that, but and, and so was mine. Um, <laughs> well, you, know, you 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 may be talking about the, I don't I don't recall, but what happened? Let, let me just let me just back up a little bit. I was I was going through what I thought was the way to get the kidney dialysis. Listen to the doctors. I had a uh, they assign you a social worker when you're doing on dialysis. Well, my social worker. And, and and I like and I like Marie first of all was um, tr you you gotta you gotta be um, you gotta you got you gotta pass through several stages before you become eligible to get on the transplant list. Mm -hmm. I was on the list at UNC at Chapel Hill for several years, but I wasn't concerned about it because I wasn't all that excited about a transplant to begin with. But somewhere during the process, my social worker let me know that I may be eligible as a veteran through their system. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, well, let's try it. I got signed up with them. They got me qualified to be on that list a very short period of time. And but we're going to give them a house applause on that. <laughs> <laughs> now, keep in mind, I was, I was, I was uh, working with UNC. I was also on a list in Charlotte. I can't remember the name of the hospital. But it's a good idea to get on several lists because um, they have access to different databases. Mm -hmm. So the more lists you're on, I guess, but you got to also keep in mind you got you to gotta qualify Mm -hmm. uh, to 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 be a recipient on that list by going through whatever their requirements are, but once I found out that I was eligible for the VA uh, transplant list, they called me on a Monday, and uh, they said, "Congratulations, Mr. Ray, you have been approved and you are on our eligibility list for the transplant." I said, "Okay, that's great." Fantastic. Mm -hmm. Check this out. Three days later, they called me and told me, they called me and they said, well, I th we were getting ready for bed. They said, Mr. Ray, we think we found you a kidney. All right. I said, wait a minute. I just got on the list Monday. <laughs> this is Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> they said, how soon can you be ready? I said, well, and they always tell you at, at, the, kidney, at, the, at the kidney center, you need to keep a bag packed. I said, well, how, long, how, how quick you need me to be ready? Uh -huh. They said, well, we're sending a pilot in to pick you up tonight and fly you out to Nashville. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, I remember there was yeah. some short period of time <laughs> between you being on that list and getting the kidney. kidney. Now, yes. take us through your recovery process. But before you do, if we have anyone that is listening – Feel free to call us at 919-899-9305 if you wish to tell us your story real quickly and real briefly or you have a question for any of our guests. Okay, go ahead, Ellis. Take okay. us through your recovery process. Recovery from the transplant itself? Yes. Okay. We flew into Nashville 
and uh, they immediately started taking uh, blood samples and tissue samples, et cetera, before, before they could proceed with the uh, transplant. Mm -hmm. And I'll, I'll never forget this. Um, I was walking around the room, you know, they would have you sit here, sit there, wait here, wait there. I was looking at they, all the nurses were staring at me. I said, what's wrong with you guys? What, what, what's, what's going on here? <laughs> and they said, Mr. Ray, you just don't understand. I said, what do you mean? She said, this, does, this just doesn't happen. Again, what do you mean? So you just got on a list Monday. This is Thursday, and you're getting a transplant. I said, oh, yeah, I hadn't thought of it that way. But I said, I said look, nurse, you don't understand. I've got connections upstairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> yeah, you you you, you got to know who I know, and uh, you know I had I had you know a lot of people that were out there wanting to give me a kidney. My son, my brother, friends. I didn't want those kidneys because I I just I had a problem with receiving a kidney from someone that was close to me. Mm -hmm. I said, I'd rather get my kidney from somebody I know is not going to need it anymore for real. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, when, once they did the transplant, and all this is new to me, but the doctors were making comments that meant didn't mean a lot to me. They were saying, God, that kidney turned pink as soon as we hooked it up. And what that meant is that the kidney was working immediately after the, uh, the surgery. Mm -hmm. Now, if you're not familiar with any of this, sometimes people receive a new kidney, but they have to go back on dialysis mm -hmm. until that kidney starts getting um, uh, getting up to speed with your body. Mm -hmm. So I don't I don't know what that whole process is like because I didn't I didn't have to go through it. But uh, you're on so many drugs uh, when you <laughs> when you get the transplant. I, I was ready to run a marathon after I woke up, you know, uh -huh. I felt like. But then the steroids um, and the, uh, the special juice they pump you up with, that kind of wears off after a while. But uh -huh. the process, you go through a period where, where they, everybody's concerned about whether your body's going to reject mm -hmm. this new organ or not. Um, and that's typical because to your body, that kidney is foreign. And your body tries to fight off foreign or what the body may refer to as an enemy. Mm -hmm. And to them, the kidney is a new kid on the block. This is an enemy. We're going to try to get rid of it. So they give you all this reject, anti-rejection medication and a lot of other things to keep your body from rejecting the new organ. Uh -huh. Now, during that period, they're also um, testing different levels of medication to see how your body responds. Um to the medications and sometimes you have some ups and downs because I ended up in the hospital at least a couple times after I got my transplant where they could make adjustments in my medicine or my routine or what have you. Uh -huh. But it's a, it, it's a journey, but uh, I just, you know, I don't, I have a tendency not to worry about things in life until I know I really got to worry about them. Uh -huh. So whatever I got to do, I just got, I got to do. And, uh, so the the whole process wasn't is uh, didn't bog me down as mu as much as it might uh, the average person. The thing that did bug me a little bit when I was in dialysis is is, is Marie was explaining the function of the dial the the, the uh, dialyzer. Mm -hmm. It it's a machine that dr takes the blood out of your body, it cleanses it, and then it replaces it to your body. It it removes the toxins and. Uh, some, and the, uh, sometimes um, it removes other things too, electrolytes or whatever, you put them back in your body. But sometimes they, they don't get it quite right. Mm -hmm. So they may take off more water from your, out of your system than uh, they needed to have done at the time. And I've had, I've had, I've had instances after dialysis uh -huh. that I've just passed out. Mm. I was on my way somewhere. As a matter of fact, I, was, I drove myself to dialysis all the time. Uh -huh. And I was leaving one day through the double doors at Davida, and it was pouring rain. And I got through the second set of doors, uh -huh. and that's all I remember. When I woke up, I was in the ER with them cutting my clothes off of me and uh, getting me treatment. Luckily for me, there happened to be a nurse out in the parking lot uh, t 
taking a cigarette break. Oh, wow. And she, <laughs> and she saw me go down, uh -huh. but she wasn't sure why I went down, whether I was picking something up off the ground or, but she never saw me come back up. So she got out of the car, rushed over to me and found it, and I was unconscious. Wow. So they called the, uh, called 911, got me to the hospital. That's, that was the biggest thing for me is, mm -hmm. is them trying to get it right as far as how much fluid to take out of your system. Okay. Wow. But the, but, but being but being a recipient of a kidney, it changes your life altogether. You can pretty much get back to normal. You uh -huh. don't have to have any special diet. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you don't you don't have to arrange your schedule in a uh, predetermined way. You know, people still ask me now when they're cooking for me, "Can you eat this?" <laughs> yeah, I could eat anything. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> now, but uh, uh, well, well, we're glad to know that you have fathered well with that ellis and i want to give you a house of applause again for your remarkable story beside you is marie who is patiently waiting for a kidney and so i believe you've given her a little bit more hope and a little bit more ease just hearing your story right there today you too can become an organ donor um you can be you can get into the organ donor program by checking out your state's registry for organ donation. Sign up with your state's registry. Um, you can uh, go to your local driver's license agency and let them know you are interested in being a donor. You can also include uh, your wishes in your health care power of attorney documents. You can let it be known there that you choose to become an organ donor because they're, like I mentioned earlier in the show, thousands of people of all ages, sizes, races, genders that need an organ. Um, now, what excludes you from being a donor? You can't have HIV, human indeficiency virus. Um, you cannot be dealing with cancer. You can't be spread. Uh, a sp you can't have actively spreading cancer cells. Uh, or a severe infection, okay? Those are the things that keep you from being an organ donor. Um, those of you that have just tuned in, you are listening to Chat City with P. Ross. I am your host, P. Ross, and we are at Oak 93.5 WRLY Raleigh. Uh, we have two very beautiful guests here today sharing, us, sharing their stories with us about kid, kidney transplants and being a candidate to receive a kidney. Marie, um, give us details on what you need from a donor, if there's anyone listening. Um, I need a kidney. <laughs> <laughs> it, um, is there a certain blood type? Oh, I am O positive. Okay, so mm -hmm. your donor match would have to be O positive. Yes. Okay. And is there an email address or contact information you would like to give our listeners um i have i do use my personal email if they have questions um but i usually give them like the coordinator of each hospital's phone okay. number okay but if they have questions just for me i do give my e my personal email out would you happen to have your coordinator information with I you do. okay well why are you looking that up ellis yes. what encouraging words do you have for anyone that may be uh, on a transplant list waiting for an organ or a kidney? Well, what, I'm, what I want all of those patiently waiting for an organ is to hear what I'm going to say to all those other folk out there that are potential donors. I was, a, I was a, uh, an organ donor before I needed an organ myself because my, my view is that wherever we are transitioning to after we leave this planet we're not going to need the organs with us so you might as well <laughs> let somebody else use them that can really uh that can really uh improve their life mm -hmm. with what you left behind i mean uh organ is a very valuable gift because it helps sustain life and there are a lot of good people um marie for instance good people that have a, a lot of good work that that's behind them and they have a lot of promise and work in front of them. Why not? Why not give donate your organ to someone that's doing this much good in the world? Mm -hmm. 
you know, I can remember being in the ninth grade and we had a gentleman, uh, I, I believe his last name was Brown. I cannot remember his first name, but he was a year ahead of me. He was a 10th grader and he died in a car accident, um, rushing home from work. He had just soiled his clothes at work and he was rushing home from work to get home to change clothes. And he accidentally wrapped his vehicle around a tree and he died. Um, he was an organ donor. So that was way back in the 80s, and it made me look at organ donation differently. Even though nervous about um, donating my own organs, but that was just very, um, I guess, inspiring and so brave of him to do it at such a young age, I thought, was to sign up to be an organ donor. Um, and in my lifetime, I have come across several people uh, who uh, were recipients of organs. All right, Marie, do you have that information for I us do. now? Do you okay. want me to just... Speak it? Yes. Okay. M-U-S-C Charleston, Charleston slash Lancaster. They're like two separate hospitals, but from the same um, school. There, the coordinator number there is 843-792-5097. Or you can go to their website, www.musc. Um, H E A L T H dot org slash living donor. And UNC is um, coordinator's number is 986 974 7568. And when you speak with someone, um, you let them know that you will, um, would like to be tested to see if you can donate for. Um, Marie Baker. Okay. Now, oh, I don't know anything about blood types. I'm sorry. I know there's AB, AB negative, mm -hmm. I think, whatever. Yours is O positive. Positive. Is mm -hmm. that a rare blood type? It is. Is that one reason why it, it may be kind of hard for you to find a recipient or a match? It Excuse is. Me, a, a match for you? <laughs> it is. Okay. So let's say that again. So we have someone who is in need of a kidney, and that is Marie Baker. Mm -hmm. um, she is a... Uh, o positive blood type and if you're just feeling generous because <laughs> I know I've heard of people just giving mm -hmm. uh, kidneys to people that they know or don't know and who knows and, and it's I think you said for you it's better that you get a living it, it is good to get a living donor donor okay. um, mm -hmm. from my understanding and what the nurses told me okay um, they have a longer life um, span uh -huh. and I mean I need a kidney. It, it doesn't, you, you know. It but doesn't matter to no, you. No, it doesn't matter to me. But okay. I, um, it would be nice to get a living donor. Um, um, yeah, it doesn't matter. And okay. I'd also like to say is with the hospitals, they do have a program called Cross Match. Okay. And this is where if I have, if you have a family member that you want to donate to, mm -hmm. Um, but you're um, you're not that ma you're not their match, so they would find someone who wanted to donate to me that might be a let's say they are a, but they are a match for your family member. They would cross match us. Okay. They would let your family family member donate to me, and my whoever wants to donate to me donate to your family member. All right. I, I didn't want to explain that because it's a hard to <laughs> explain, but it's called cross match. Cross match. Okay, mm -hmm. Marie. And Ellis, again, I want to say thank you for taking time out of your schedules to be here on Chat City with P. Ross, giving us your wonderful, powerful stories. I know you have helped someone today. Thank you. All right. Thank Th you. This thank ends you. Chat City with P. Ross. Tune back with us again on next Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern Time. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your week. From Linwood, this is WRLYLP Raleigh. From Feature Story News in Washington, D.C., I'm Benji Hire.